Kevin Rice. I'm going to be reading from Romans 11, verses 1 through 6, out of the NIV. I asked them, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know that scripture says in the passage about Elijah how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal. So too at the present time, there is a, re a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Thank you very much, Kevin. Would you all pray with me? Heavenly Father, uh, we praise you for the truths that we have been singing. Praise you for who you are and what you have accomplished through your Son. Father, as we open your word this morning, just pray that we have hearts to hear and just eyes to see what you have been doing and will continue to do until the fullness of time has come. And we pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the last time uh, I was up here during Romans, we were at the end of October, and we were looking at the end of uh, Romans chapter 8. And as I was thinking through what we're in today and what we're going to get into, um, I thought it'd be fitting to go back and, and just take a moment to kind of do a recap of the month plus we spent in Romans 8. And so uh, if you remember uh, at that last Sunday of October, the uh, arc of assurance that Paul builds in Romans chapter 8, and it looks kind of something like this. This is the path he walks through from bottom left to top right, uh, that there is no condemnation, right? There's Believers are free from judgment if we are in Christ. Um, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Uh, the, this describes God's gospel posture towards his people, as Pastor Steve put it, and it's a posture of no condemnation. And that gospel empowers us to righteousness. From there, Paul argues about uh, there is no obligation, right? Believers are free from defeat in verses 5 to 7. And the believers uh, walk according to the Spirit uh, by having minds set upon him, and that we're no longer obligated to walk in the ways of our former self, but we are able to uh, walk in the newness of life. And the Holy Spirit uh, gives witness that we are adopted children of God. Then the third kind of ation of the Ark of Assurance is this no frustration, the idea being that we're free from discouragement, verses 18 to 30, a bigger piece there. And that the sufferings of the present time pale in comparison to the glory that is about to be revealed, that we see the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, uh, and we know that all things work together for good for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then that last part of Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39, we see no separation, that believers are to be free and are free from fear because God is for his people and there's no one that can harm us in any meaningful way. There is no thing uh, that not in heaven, not in earth, that can separate believers from the love of God in Christ Jesus, who God has in his hands, he holds securely. And this all led us towards that, we followed that arc of assurance, and if you remember, we landed somewhere, and it was that, uh, oh, hang on, there should be one more. Oh, no. Womp, womp. All right, well, there was up there in the corner, it said adoration and celebration, right? This, this arc of assurance leads us to adoration and to celebration, and if you think about it, we all love Romans 8, right? Possibly the greatest chapter and the greatest letter that's ever been written and the greatest book that, ever, that has ever been compiled, right? Like, where Romans 8 takes us, we love these truths. We love the promises that dwell within 
Romans chapter 8. That's what leads us to adoration of God and celebration of those truths. And so in Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul has now moved uh, from those promises to address Israel. And I think if we're not careful, we can read 9, 10, and 11 as like this add-on to Paul's letter versus uh, if like, it makes sense, like, hey, we go in this adoration celebration, now here's how you live, chapter 12, right? And so we just blow over 9, 10, and 11. Uh, but what he's doing here is very important. When he's talking about what's going on with Israel, it's God's chosen nation, right? And if you remember, Paul says that he has a great sorrow and unceasing anguish for his fellow Jews. And all of Romans 9 and 10 leads us to this next question that we're going to address today from Paul. That's the start of our passage in Romans 11, verse 1. Paul says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, right? He, he has this emphatic response, by no means. He's writing in such a way that he is hearing the dissenter, right? Pastor Steve talked about this, this, this objector, this opposition, and he's hearing it without hearing it. He's addressing it and then bringing uh, his readers to the point of answering the question that has yet to be asked. And he's done this multiple times. He's built this beautiful argument through the first 10 chapters, and it continues here in chapter 11. And so, based on what he's saying, the question really becomes, has God rejected his people, that is Israel? So what does Paul mean by the word rejected? This is not asking whether or not God has refused to receive his people. He's already done that. What Paul is addressing here is whether or not God has thrust away from himself. Has he cast away the people he long ago had received as his own? But he identified. It's not as though Israel is coming to God and he's saying, no thanks. Has he cast this nation away from him? And all of Romans 11 is really going to address this question. And it kind of splits into two parts, into chapter, or verses 1 through 10 and then verses 11 to the end. And so you kind of, he kind of addresses all of this. And if you'll see that as we work through chapter 11, it's the same path as that arc in chapter 8, where eventually it leads to adoration and celebration when he gets to his doxology in verses 33 to 36. Like his whole argument is still building to another moment of this explosion of worship that we are going to see. And so as Paul is working through this, he's going to show us that God is not through with Israel. God is not through with Israel. There is a real, literal future for a real, literal people, a real, literal nation. And the way Paul frames the question should bring to mind, maybe, maybe not, a couple of Old Testament passages that clearly state that God is not going to cast away his people. 1 Samuel 12, reads, For the Lord will not forsake his people, for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Psalm 94, 14, for the Lord will not forsake his people, he will not abandon his heritage. And so the question ultimately puts God and his word kind of on trial. And so ultimately, the question that's being asked is, has God's word failed? And that's a very serious issue to contend with. Has God's word failed? The evidence of which bringing this question to mind is connected to the rejection of his covenant people, of Israel. And so Paul responds to the question emphatically, right? He's done this eight times prior, by no means, absolutely not, God forbid. Depending on which translation you're reading, which phrase you get, by no means, right? And so God continues to treat Israel as his people in faithfulness to his word, his promises. This is kind of Paul's thesis now for chapter 11. And the theme of all of chapter 11 is found in verse 2, right at the beginning there. God has not rejected his people. This theme is, is a thread that is woven throughout the history and is recorded in the Old Testament, the history of this nation. From the time of Abraham to Paul's time and beyond, the history of Israel is a testimony of God's 
providential governing of human history. Through it all, the nation of Israel never lost its ethnic or national identity. And when I had, like, when that idea came to mind, you think of all the trials and tribulations and travel and here and there and being without a land and having a land and not having a land. They've never lost their ethnic or national identity. So despite Israel, despite her, her disobedience, she remains the people of God, preserved by God. And so this truth will lead Paul somewhere. Like I said, as he works through these arguments coming in this chapter, builds his case, it just is going to culminate into this explosion of worship and praise. And where Paul's theology grows and overflows, it explodes into this doxology, and it just becomes this overwhelming praise of God. And that's where we're headed for Easter. Like it's, it's beautiful how this chapter and how this, bringing back, coming back to 9, 10, 11, how it plays out, and we land with that doxology, that moment of worship from Paul at Easter when we should all be just adoring and celebrating Jesus our King. And so what's at stake in this for us, right? We're not Israel, so why does this even matter? If Paul's thesis, if that thesis, that thesis, you're not looking at this screen, you're looking at this one. If Paul's thesis isn't true, then what confidence and assurance do we have in all the truths of the gospel that he's laid out so far, the outworking of the gospel that he's talked about so far, the outworking of the gospel he's going to talk about come chapter 12, every promise that Paul has already presented, everything that we've walked through over the months and months that we've spent in Romans, from chapter 1 through 8, if that's not true, what confidence and assurance do we have? And so the argument that Paul's building in Romans 9, 10, and 11 in regards to Israel's status helps us to understand our foundation. And so is your faith built on solid rock? Is it built on the shifting sands? And so Paul's digging down and saying, look, here's the foundation, right? He's digging a hole next to the argument and saying, look, there it is. Let's talk about the foundation, right? And that foundation, the foundation of our hope is solid rock, and it is Jesus Christ, and so this is why he can answer so emphatically, by no means, right? It's because God is faithful that he can answer so, so strongly. And he continues in our chapter, and he gives us four kind of supports to hold up as the foundation of this passage for his confidence. And so he has four arguments, and the first one being himself. Paul writes, I myself and an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. In the opening of his letter, Paul introduced himself. If you remember way back, I didn't go back to look to see when, what date the Hello, I'm Paul message was, but it was a while back, right? We've, we've taken our time walking through Romans. And Pastor Steve framed Paul's identity as who I am, a servant of Jesus Christ, as Paul, of Paul's identity was framed as what he is, what I am, an apostle who is called into that role, and why I am. So Paul's who, his what, and his why. And his why was one who was set apart for the gospel. And so there Paul gave an identity of who he was and introduced himself at the beginning of the letter. Here he highlights other aspects of his identity. He is an Israelite. This is the people's covenant name given by God. Right? This points to the covenant that God made with Jacob, he calls himself and identifies himself as a descendant of Abraham. He's not a convert to Judaism. He was born a Jew. And this being a descendant of Abraham is a decisive designation for a Jew. Right? He is a son of Abraham. Abraham was part of Paul's teaching earlier in this letter, which connects to what we're going to get to here in this part of the letter. He also calls himself one of the tribe of Benjamin. And this one I had no idea why he was referring to being part of the tribe of Benjamin. So I had to go look it up. And it was that this tribe was smaller than many of the others. But it was very significant in Israel's history. And one commentator wrote, it has been noted that Benjamin was one of the few tribes left in his day, that could, in Paul's day, that could trace their ancestry all the way back being from the southern tribes who returned after the Babylonian exile, who could trace their lineage all the way back to Abraham. And so the first argument, the first leg 
of the foundation that Paul shows us is what I call the Paul argument. If God were, in fact, done with the Jews, Paul says, how do you explain me, a Jew? If God were done with the Jews, hi, I'm Paul, right? Like, and he explains, talks about himself here. And so you think about it, Paul was what? An overzealous Jew, right? A Hebrew of Hebrews, uh, a Pharisee of Pharisees, if you will, right? And you think about Paul's, uh, as he comes onto the scene in Scripture, he's doing what? Persecuting the church. And he, if God had rejected all the Jews, Paul would have been included in that rejection. That's his argument here. And so if God were in fact done with the Jews, how do you explain me, Paul, a Jew? Right? And we know from Acts that Christ intervenes on the road to Damascus, changes uh, Paul's name to Paul from Saul, changes his life, calls him into service for himself. And so Paul is a living and breathing example. He is evidence that God has not abandoned Israel completely. Paul's sec- second uh, argument is that of election. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. God can't unknow those he has foreknown. And this is why God remains faithful to that people. This foreknowing is an intimate and loving relationship with those he has called to himself before the foundation of the world. Israel is the only nation that God has foreknown foreknown and predetermined to be his people. And this all points, this argument here that God has not rejected his people for whom he has foreknown or who he foreknew, points back to the words of Amos, where Amos writes, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. God's foreknowing of his people For knowing this people indicates that this had taken place before Israel had done anything, anything to merit being God's choice in this. This is all part of God's sovereignty, something that Pastor Steve walked through in his sermon at the start of Romans 9, the beginning of February. Paul's third argument, the third leg upon which the truth will stand, is that of history, or Elijah. Right. Paul says, do you, do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Right? And Paul's saying, like, certainly you know this story. Elijah fleeing in the wilderness, running from Queen Jezebel who seeks to kill him. This is in 1 Kings 18-19. Right? Before he's running, let's just recap it for our own benefit. He's confronted the, the prophets of Baal, 1 Kings 18. He challenges them to, um, my sanctified imagination was like, an offering off, right? Like, like, you put an offering, I'll put an offering, we'll see which God responds, right? And he calls on God, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Right? Elijah is coming off this amazing spiritual experience. His God has defeated the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Jezebel, the queen, hears about this and sends this death threat to Elijah because she's on team Baal. And so Elijah flees into the wilderness, eventually asking God, Like, just take my life. And he's visited by an angel of the Lord who tells him to rise and eat. He does so. He's visited again. Rise and eat. He does so. And he journeys on to Horeb, the Mount of God, where he goes into a cave to stay. And it's in this cave that God speaks to him. He says, what are you doing here? And Elijah responds, I have been jealous for the Lord. The, The people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, killed your prophets, and I am the only one left. And they want to kill me too. And eventually God reveals to to Elijah, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal. 
And so what Paul's doing by bringing Elijah and history into his argument here in chapter 11, he's saying that just as Elijah thought God was done with his people and that only he, Elijah, was left, that was not the case, nor is that the case here. There is more than meets the eye when it comes to God's working. God had preserved a remnant, kept them, thousands of Israelites from bowing the knee to Baal in worship. As Paul kind of recounts that event, the preservation of the remnant is seen elsewhere in Scripture. When Isaiah was called to preach, God warned him that the majority would not listen, but that a small holy remnant would remain. Well, God's people were in Babylonian captivity. Most of them turned away from the Lord their God. But a godly remnant remained. The likes of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach, Abednego, Ezekiel, Mordecai, Esther, and so on. Before Jesus was born, there was a godly remnant remaining in Zacharias and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph and so on. Right? God preserved a remnant then, Paul is saying, he a, preserves a remnant now in Paul's time, and that remnant is embracing Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And so God is not done with Israel, right? There's more than meets the eye. And so God's preservation of a remnant was evidence of his past faithfulness. And it's also a pledge of hope for the future of his people. And the Lord in his grace preserves his people. And Paul confirms that with his next statement and argument, which is the grace argument. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. There is, in fact, a remnant now, Paul says, and this remnant is chosen in one way, and that is by grace. And Paul had already talked about God's grace in this letter. Romans 1, 5, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. Romans 3, 23, 24, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. Romans 5, 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift is not like the result of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Romans 5, uh, 20, 21, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus. Romans six fourteen: for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Right? Paul has brought up grace numerous times in this letter, and he brings it up again here. And Paul puts in this statement here, Grace and works squarely at odds with one another. Squarely opposite one another. Grace is grace until works enters the picture. Once works, that is anything we can do, comes into play, it's no longer grace. The two cancel each other out, and, and God's grace is unmerited. It's undeserved love and favor towards his people. Uh, one commentator wrote, we can give no reason why God should be gracious. There is no reason for grace but grace itself. And it is God's grace that guarantees that this remnant will be preserved. The remnant in the Old Testament past, the remnant in Paul's time, today, and into the future were not and are not and will not be elect based on any virtue of their own. It is always it always has been and always will be a function of God's sovereign election and his grace. And as I was thinking through this, I was asking myself, why is grace so important to Paul? And one commentator I was reading about this, he wrote that Paul, there's a list of 81 different verses in all of his various letters where Paul brings up grace. So why is grace so important to Paul? And I think it's because he himself is a trophy of God's grace. This remnant is a trophy of God's grace. If you are in Christ, you are a trophy of God's grace. I am a trophy of God's grace. 
Paul sees grace everywhere he looks. He never wants to forget God's grace, and he never wants his readers to forget it either. Right? We struggle with grace. Right? It can't be that simple. Right? We as humans have this natural propensity that we want to add to it. Right? There must be something I have to do in order to earn this grace. But again, as soon as those thoughts creep in, what are you doing? You're canceling out grace because you're adding works to it. Right? There must be something I have to do, but it's not true. Again, the only reason for grace is grace. And I can't, I can't fathom it. I can't unwrap my mind around God's grace, but I'm grateful for it. I sure am grateful for it. The only reason for grace is grace, and that's true of Paul. It's true of the Jewish remnant. It's true of you, it's true of me, if you're in Christ. And all four of these arguments lead us to one truth. And again, that's God is not done with his people. God is not done with his people. So Paul continues, starting in verse 7, if you'd read with me. What then? Everything I've said now, okay, what, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. What then? This is kind of Paul's signal here that he's making some conclusive statements of all that he's been talking about up to this point in, in chapters 9, 10, and 11. And he just gives a brief recap of, of what has happened with Israel to this point. But then he divides the nation into two groups, the remnant and the rest. And so he's saying, if, if a remnant has been saved, then what about the rest? What about the rest? Well, the rest have failed to obtain what it was seeking, which Paul already told us in Romans 9.31. Right? They pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, but did not succeed in reaching that law. Their zeal was for their own pursuit of righteousness in their own way. They couldn't accept the gift when it was presented to them. This rest refused to submit to Christ's righteousness, just as Religious and self-righteous people today refuse. They tried to earn their way to righteousness. They couldn't accept the gift. They refused the gift. And it's a gift that was made available through Jesus Christ. And as a result of their refusal, God hardened them. We see the same sort of hardening in Exodus with Pharaoh. God judiciously hardens Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh willingly hardened his own heart against God. And he does the same here with the rest. And so I ask, if you are in Christ, having trusted in Christ alone, by faith alone, are you God's people? You are God's people. Right? And so some kind of takeaways for us. The hope that Israel has in his promises to her parallel the hopes that we have based on his promises to us, right? Trust God's grace. It is the only path to peace. One commentator I was reading, and I loved the way he phrased this, as long as you are trusting to your own good works, what Israel was trying to do, the rest were trying to do, you will never have personal peace of mind and heart, nor should you. Live by works, perish by works, right? There were Jews in the rest that relied on their ethnic identity as their supposed path to salvation. And there are some in our culture that would ascribe to a Christian lifestyle or would identify as Christian without really actually following Christ, without actually seeing him as their only hope. They would ascribe to, I'm a Christian, yet I still fall under my own works. 
There's a cultural Christianity such as, you know, going always, well, I always go to church. Like we've heard that argument. Well, what is your hope? Well, I know all the Bible stories, right? All the Sunday school stories, I know all those. Well, I was, I was my, my parents are Christian, so therefore I'm a Christian. I was born a Christian, right? Or I grew up in the church. I even got baptized, right? I take communion. But all these blessings, all these things that we do that should point us to Christ can become curses if they're merely external actions and not internal realities. Right? Salvation is by grace alone and faith alone through Christ alone. That's an internal reality that then leads to all the external blessings. It doesn't work the other way around. As we were studying through the, the Gospel of Mark with, youth, uh, with our youth group, we were uh, getting to the point, and, and I was love how the Spirit works and times things out. We're looking at the rich young ruler, the rich young man in, in Mark's Gospel. The same time Pastor Steve uses it to introduce his message a few weeks ago. Um, and we kind of split, like, there's do religion and done religion, right? So we kind of split it into two big camps, right? Do religion, right? The do, do religions are every worldly and man-made religion, right? You do this, you might earn salvation. You do this, and you'll be in a better position, right? Everything, every day, every action, every word goes onto a scale, and you got to hope that scale is tipped in just the right way that you can reach uh, whatever heaven would be there. Right? There can be no peace in that sort of system because you're always trying to add and add and add and add and add to what's on the good side of your scale. Right? And so the rich young man in Mark 10, what was the question he asked? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus you know, corrects him. So you have do religion, and then you have done religion. Done religion is Christianity. What did Christ say on the cross? It is finished. It is done, right? We accept his completed work as sufficient for our salvation, right? There is nothing that we need to do to add to it. We live accordingly not to earn our salvation, right? But to, to live because of our salvation. The good works that flow from us, serving in the, in the community, helping with the food distribution in a couple weeks here. All those things come not in order to earn, to add to our good side of our scale, to try and outweigh the bad, right? No, we do because we've already been forgiven in Christ. Right? We see this pattern in John 8 with the woman who's caught in adultery. Right? They want to stone her. Jesus says, well, whoever amongst you is without sin, stone her. You start. And they all walk away, right? What's he tell her? I don't condemn you. Go, sin no more. Right? It's, I don't condemn you. Go, sin no more. Not, go, sin no more, and maybe I won't condemn you. Right? Christianity is done religion. We rest in the faithfulness of Christ's work. That his atoning work is all we need for salvation. Right? And Jesus tells his disciples back in Mark 10 regarding salvation, after he, the rich young man walks away, he says, with man it is impossible. Right? The do religions, it's impossible. But now with God, for all things are possible with God, that is Christianity. And so our takeaway truth for this morning is that God's word is true. Right? Great is his Faithfulness Throughout history, times have seen bleak for one reason or another in regards to God's people. Just recently, things seemed kind of bleak for a nation we know as Israel. Yet, God still works. He remains faithful and true to his word. And whenever Satan has tried to, to frustrate and and overcome God's plan over the thousands of years that he's been at work. God has turned what Satan has brought about for good. Right? The Jews denied Jesus, killing him, 
Satan's, hey, boom, I've won, right? Nope, God raises from the dead, conquers Satan in the process, and we're going to celebrate that in Easter, right? He is risen, he is risen indeed. The early believers were persecuted by the Jews. Stephen was even stoned to death. And then those early believers are scattered. And how does God use it? He uses it to fulfill Jesus' own words in Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, did that come true? Yeah, we're sitting here in Westlake, Ohio, 6,000 miles from Jerusalem. I think that plan has gone forth. Right? All that God has said will come to pass. Will come to pass. All of it. Psalm 33, 11, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. These are promises that we can cling to. And the reason we can cling to those promises is because you are a trophy of God's grace. So tell others about it. Don't put yourself on a shelf like we do with trophies. No, you tell others about it. And if you're not a trophy of God's grace and you're sitting here this morning, you can be. Right? You are sitting in sin and enmity and strife with the holy God. And there is nothing that you can do. Nothing. Not a single thing you can do to cover that chasm. But you don't have to because Jesus has already done it. So if you don't trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, here's the invitation. You can. Repent of your sin. Believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And you become that trophy of God's grace. And if you have questions around that, Pastor Steve, myself, Chuck Posley, just about anybody in this room who's a follower of Christ would love to talk with you about that. We'd love to. Nothing more than to talk about that. So if you have questions, come see us, talk to us, please. And so kind of where does that leave us as, and lead us as 24-7 worshipers, as alongsiders, and as go people? As 24-7 worshipers, good theology leads to worship and praise. It's an overflow of the heart. Again, that's where all of Romans 11 is headed into this overflow of Paul's worship and praise. And then we flow out of Romans 11 into Romans 12, and it becomes practical worship for your life, how to live in such a way that you are worshiping with every moment of your life. As alongsiders, remind each other of God's grace in your life. Share your testimonies. If you haven't recorded your testimony with Pastor Steve and myself yet on the podcast, we would love to have you do that. It's been such a, an encouraging and edifying time for me just sitting there listening and just seeing the trophies of God's grace that he has, he has brought here to Grace Baptist Church in Westlake. Testimonies are powerful. Your story is powerful. Use the unique circumstances that God brought about in your life that brought you to him to encourage one another. Life groups, share testimonies if you haven't already. Maybe make it a point from here on to the end of life group season. One or two every time you get together. Just share your testimonies. Because I can, I, I can guarantee you're going to encourage each other with those testimonies. Right? God is in control of human history, and your, your story is part of that. And as go people, make disciples by God's grace. Right? I think we can often try and just, like, we get caught up in things that don't really matter for our, our gospel witness. 
is this person elect or not? Uh, I don't know. Don't try and figure it out. Just share the gospel, right? We're to make disciples, not to judge and try and figure out if they're on the right side or wrong or not, or if they're in the in or the out. Like, no, no, share the gospel, right? And use your story, your story of, again, God's grace in your life. Use that as you talk to others. Because, again, testimonies are extremely powerful. God's word is true. Great is his faithfulness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Father, we praise you for your word. We praise you for the work that you continue to do with the nation of Israel. We praise you for the Apostle Paul and his writings that we have them in such a way that we can read them and study them and cling to them. And in so doing, Father, we can grow closer to you and grow in Christ-likeness. Father, use our time today in your word to draw us near to you, to embolden us to share our testimonies, to trust in the promises of your word, to trust in you. Father, again, if there's anyone in this room who doesn't know you, Father, I pray that they would have the courage and the boldness today to ask a question, to come before you in humility and, and submit. Father, use this body of believers as testimonies of your grace, of your working in Westlake and Amherst and Lorraine and Elyria, Brook Park, Fairview Park, North Ridgeville, everywhere that our people live and spend the bulk of their week, Father, in each of their workplaces, in their schools. Father, use them all as testimonies of your grace and your love. Let them reflect your son, Jesus Christ. Just overflow with your son in all that we say, all that we do. And Father, we come before you and we ask this in the only way that we can, and that is through your son, Jesus Christ. We ask, we pray all of this in his wonderful name. Persisted, I made love. 